tonight. What Trump really thinks about the Dreamers, fighting for the Ganges, and okay. exposure therapy in VR. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Former governor and UN ambassador Bill Richardson has resigned from an international panel that was created to advise Myanmar on its humanitarian crisis in Rakhine State. Richardson announced he's leaving the advisory board because he doesn't want to be part of a, quote, cheerleading squad for the government. And he said the country's civilian leader, Aung San Suu Kyi, is lacking moral leadership. Richardson spoke to Vice News and disputed the government's account that they asked him to step down because he was pursuing his own agenda. During a meeting with Suu Kyi, Richardson brought up the case of two Reuters journalists being detained in Myanmar. I said to her, you should start by releasing these two journalists and let the press look at what's happening in the Rakhine, the atrocities, the human rights. And she snapped at me and said, this is not in your charter. Uh, this is not what you should be doing. Almost yelling at me. She doesn't want any frank advice. She wants validation of her government policies, which are not working. The Department of Education is being sued over its decision to roll back Obama-era guidelines for how schools should respond to sexual violence. In September, Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos said the new guidance would treat all students fairly when a complaint is made. But the suit, filed today by several advocacy groups, says the change discriminates against students who report sexual assault. And the plaintiffs allege it was motivated by a stereotype that women and girls, quote, lack credibility on sexual harassment. A Department of Education spokesman said they don't comment on pending litigation. New Hampshire Senator Jean Shaheen is calling for a Senate investigation into the U.S. Olympic Committee and USA Gymnastics after former team doctor Larry Nassar was sentenced for sexual abuse. Nassar received up to 175 years in prison yesterday, and more than 150 girls and women have come forward to accuse him. Shaheen said both organizations have serious questions to answer about how Nassar's criminal behavior continued unchecked and she urged her colleagues to start a committee to investigate the matter before the Winter Games start next month. Scientists have discovered a human jawbone that's at least 177,000 years old inside a collapsed cave off the coast of Israel. It's the oldest human fossil that's ever been discovered outside of Africa, and it suggests that modern humans started venturing to other continents about 55,000 years earlier than previously thought. White House policy advisor Stephen Miller briefed GOP congressional staff today on the immigration deal that President Trump wants to see. $25 billion for a border wall and an end to so-called chain migration. In exchange for a pathway to citizenship for undocumented immigrants who arrived as minors, even if they never applied for DACA. While both sides of the aisle already have some real problems with this proposal, it does highlight something pretty rare in the Trump era. Presidential consistency. One of the things that makes the immigration debate so difficult is that everyone here in DC says they don't know what Trump stands for. But on DACA, it's not true. Yes, Trump is basically an immigration hardliner trying to buy an office full of hardliners. But every time you get him alone, with reporters or even Democrats, he routinely volunteers that he wants to do something for the dreamers. And he's been consistent on stuff like this. Back in 2015, in the early stages of the presidential campaign, Trump went on Breitbart Radio. Steve Bannon, his future campaign CEO and White House senior advisor, was the host. Trump told Bannon a story about a talented young immigrant who went to college here, got booted from the country, and started a prosperous business back home in India. We have to be careful of that, Steve. You know, we have to keep our talented people in this country. Um, I think you agree with that. Do you agree? Well, with that? I, I got a tougher, you know, when two thirds or three quarters of the CEOs in Silicon Valley are from South Asia or from Asia, I think well, that, on, 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 a, yeah. on my point is that a country's more like a, a sessions, a country's more than an economy. We're a civic society. So let's summarize that. Trump says his natural instinct is to let people who can contribute to the economy stay in the U.S. Bannon says his natural instinct is to be skeptical of that 
because an influx of immigrants could put our civic society in danger. This kind of push-pull between Trump and the far right who elected him has played out throughout his administration. When he first said DACA would come to an end, Democrats convinced him to tweet that dreamers shouldn't worry about being deported. But not long after that, he said he wouldn't do anything to help dreamers unless Democrats agreed to build his wall. When he had that open immigration negotiating session before the cameras the other day, Trump seemed to agree with the Democrats on the DREAM Act. What about a clean DACA bill now, and with a commitment that we go into a comprehensive immigration reform procedure? Would be agreeable to that? Yeah, I would like, I would like to do that. Go ahead. I think a lot of people would like to see that. But I think we have to do DACA first. House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy basically had to throw himself in front of the bus to stop Trump from making a deal with Democrats on TV. Mr. President, Mr. President you, you need to be clear, though. I, I, th I think what Senator Feinstein's asking here, when we talk about just DACA, we don't want to be back here two years later. You have to have security. Today, the White House confirmed what Trump told reporters last night, that his vision for a dream wall compromise includes a pathway to citizenship. We're going to morph into it. It's going to happen what at some that point what in the future. Morph into it? What over, does that mean? over a period, over a period of ten to twelve years. Again, Trump clearly in favor of protecting Dreamers. But here's the thing: it was Trump himself who ended DACA last fall, unilaterally, bowing to the conservative line that the program was illegal. And of course, he's the guy pushing travel bans and cracking down on sanctuary cities. The paradox can be crazy-making for political observers and for the people who spend their lives figuring this stuff out. The executive director of the National Immigration Law Center told me it doesn't really matter what's in Trump's heart. It doesn't even really matter what comes out of his mouth. We have been told by people that when it comes to children and the young people that he apparently does have kind of a soft heart. He's being undermined by his own staff, specifically Chief of Staff Kelly and Miller. There are probably other voices as well. What makes him unreliable, and it's hard to believe what he really wants, is his flip-flopping. We are where we are because Trump created this crisis, and only he can fix it, and Republicans control Congress. And so, at the end of the day, if the legislation fails, it's on them. Immigration isn't President Trump's only signature issue, and on the other, he and his populist base are perfectly in step. Anybody ever hear of NAFTA? I ran a campaign somewhat based on NAFTA. The Clintons gave us NAFTA. Think of it. The worst trade deal ever signed by any country ever. I'm going to renegotiate NAFTA, one of the worst trade deals ever signed in the history of our country, perhaps the worst ever signed in the history, frankly, of the world. When Trump makes big promises on trade, his supporters eat it up. Now he has to deliver. And as the NAFTA partners meet this week to try to hash out changes to the agreement, Trump has the perfect sidekick, the ideologically aligned, logically precise Spock to his Kirk. His name? Robert Lighthizer. I do think that he shares a lot of the same inclinations as President Trump, but the real difference is he actually knows how to carry those out in practice. Uh, he's absolutely not a bumbling fool. I'm not suggesting that President Trump is, but one could imagine installing somebody like that in this position, and he's absolutely not that. He's a very, very sharp mind. Lighthizer was the deputy U.S. trade representative for Ronald Reagan in the 80s. And then he practiced international law for 30 years in D.C., where he worked to hold back the tide of imports that threatened the domestic steel and auto industries. I think to some extent you can judge a, a trade agreement by the extent to which the people that are your trading partners that you're really negotiating against have not accomplished their objectives. His views haven't changed over time. In 2008, he wrote an op-ed attacking the, quote, utopian dreams of free traders. It is a great honor for me to appear before you today. And by the time of his confirmation hearing, he had adopted Trump's rhetoric. That we should have an America first trade policy and that we can do better in negotiating our trade agreements and, and be stronger in enforcing our trade laws. 
People who know Lighthizer say comparisons between Trump and his chief negotiator, however, are unfair. They're totally different. I met him when he was in the Reagan administration. Lighthizer is actually a very thoughtful person, and if he's going to say something, it's for effect, not because he lacks impulse control. His irreverence to me is refreshing. To others, it might be off-putting. So it really depends on how you like your trade negotiators. You want him boring and staid, then he's not for you. If you want him provocative and uh, irreverent and fun and effective, uh, he's your guy. The U.S., Mexico, and Canada are now in the sixth round of NAFTA renegotiation. And Trump and Lighthizer have turned the talks upside down. Take dairy. Canada protects its own dairy farmers with a mix of high tariffs and strict regulations. So a typical U.S. administration would be trying to make it easier to get more American milk or cheese or ice cream onto the Canadian market. That's not what the Trump administration is doing. What they're doing that's controversial is they're basically saying, you've exported too much to us under NAFTA. We want to take that away from you. It's not that we want to export more to you. We actually want to raise trade barriers to you. And that's very new. That's not how any successful trade negotiations, new trade agreements um, have ever been conducted. One reason Lighthizer and Trump want to renegotiate NAFTA is America's huge trade deficit, which is the term for when a country imports more than it exports. Addressing it has been Trump's number one demand from the word go, and Lighthizer has turned it into a real sticking point. We have seen no indication that our partners are willing to make any changes that will result in a rebalancing and a reduction in these huge trade deficits. But the trade imbalance with NAFTA countries isn't all that big, especially compared with, say, China. And experts say it's the wrong metric by which to judge trade deals anyway. It only focuses on one side of the ledger. It's only looking at the the trade in manufactured goods, right? It doesn't take into account the trade in services. And we have a surplus with Mexico when it comes to services, as we do with with the rest of the world. The big question remains, will Trump follow through on his threats to drop out of NAFTA if Lighthizer can't get concessions? Press reports suggest repeated conversations with farm state senators like Iowa's Joni Ernst and Nebraska's Deb Fisher, as well as meetings with pro-trade business groups like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, are having an effect. And leaving NAFTA could have serious consequences for U.S. trade. One thing that's come out of this is the Canadian-Mexican relationship has strengthened dramatically. The Mexicans announced uh, earlier this week that they're on the verge of concluding a new free trade agreement with Europe. They're in the process of negotiating a deal with uh, Argentina and Brazil. They're moving very aggressively, and I frankly think this will go down as one of the great self-inflicted wounds uh, of all time. But Lighthizer's old friend says he's not as hell-bent on blowing up NAFTA as some might think. I think that um, whether he planted the dynamite all over the bridge doesn't mean he plans to detonate it. I don't believe he wants to, to get rid of NAFTA. I think he wants to make it better. will be swimming in the Ganges this week for the annual Mag Mela festival, just as they have for years. But it's not a pleasant swim. The Ganges is one of the world's most polluted rivers. That isn't just a problem for swimmers. More than 500 million people depend on the Ganges as their main source of water. And despite a multi-billion dollar cleanup initiative that India announced in 2014, the river hasn't gotten any safer for them. come to see the beautiful Ganga here to experience its warmth that is giving it to us. Tell me about the spiritual significance that you feel. It cannot be said, it is to be felt. For India's nearly one billion Hindus, 
who believe that if a body is burned and returned to the river at Varanasi, it can escape reincarnation. The Ganges is one of the most sacred places on Earth, but it's also one of the most polluted. Oh, dear Jesus. You can smell it. How much sewage is coming out there right now? 150 million liters per day. How many people's sewage is that? One million. So that's the shit of a million people flowing into the Ganga yeah. every day. Yeah. This is just one drain. Environmental scientist Rakesh Jaiswal has been campaigning for a cleaner Ganges for 25 years. Today, Ganga is more polluted than it was 30 years ago. And to last 24 years, I have seen the situation worsening only. No improvement at all. In total, drains along the Ganges empty a billion gallons of raw sewage and industrial waste into the river every day. Decomposing bodies make their way into the water from riverside crematoriums. And in Kanpur, hundreds of tanneries release toxic chemicals and heavy metals into the river, which is the city's source of water. Half of Kanpur city, including me, was getting drinking water from River Ganga. The water there was highly contaminated, containing uh, city wastewater and also a contaminated discharge from TB hospital, tuberculosis hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah. As you can imagine, contaminated water puts the population at risk of disease, including cholera, typhoid, and viral diarrhea. Why aren't there processing centers or uh, you know water treatment facilities or infrastructure, basically, to... This is the inability and inefficiency of the government. In 2014, Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced Namami Gange, a $3 billion cleanup initiative. The government commissioned an official pop anthem for the river, and there has been talk of starting breeding programs with flesh-eating turtles that can deal with decomposing bodies in the water. But Namame Gange never took off. Three years later, reports say that just $205 million has been spent, and India's top environmental court declared it a failure, saying, quote, not a single drop has been cleaned so far. Three years are already gone, and uh, there is nothing concrete on the ground. Not even one waste like management no, facility? No, not even uh, one new treatment plan. In March 2017, a court in Uttarakhand took the matter into its own hands and gave the Ganges legal personhood status. What does giving a river the status of personhood do for the river? Theoretically, what it can do is just like a, a, a legal entity can sue somebody. But there were no lawsuits. Shortly after the Ganges became a legal person, the Supreme Court intervened and stopped it. Giving um, a legal right or a legal status by itself will mean nothing. Shadan Farasat is a Supreme Court lawyer. He says that giving the Ganges the right to sue polluters has some logical issues, and not just because a river can't represent itself in court. It doesn't really emphasize how that status of a juristic or legal personality is going to help in cleaning up the river or improving the ecosystem of the river. That analysis is completely absent from the judgment. So is it purely symbolic? I would think so. You know, it's the court trying to clean up the river, but with the wrong tool. When the personhood order was scrapped, a legal route to forcing government action was closed. But not everyone is worried about the toxic waste and sewage that continue to pour into the Ganges. There's a persistent myth among the public and even scientists that the river is so holy, it's essentially self-cleaning. If you drink the water, then it will help in improvement of your health. B.D. Tripathi is a professor and former expert for the National Ganga River Basin Authority, the agency responsible for overseeing the implementation of Modi's cleanup program. He is surprisingly optimistic about the situation. If you increase the flow into the water, then 60 to 80 percent organic pollution problem will be automatically resolved. Really? Yes. You believe that the River Ganga can heal itself if there's more water in the River Ganga? Of course, 100 percent true. If water is there, if flow is maintained, 
Ganga will solve its own pollution problem. Dilution is the solution of pollution. So we can still Simply. dump sewage into yes, yes, dump yes, tannery yes, waste. Yes, 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 yes. Tripathi's belief in the Ganges' power is misplaced. Industrial waste accumulates in the environment over time and can't simply be diluted. Still, the river's pollution isn't stopping people from going to the Ganges to be cleansed. So you're not sort of bothered by the pollution? No, not bothered. Have you guys taken a dip? I can go do it right now. <laughs> I'm so fond of Ganga. <laughs> you would hop in right now? Yeah, I love Ganga. Do you feel like this is something that's really impacting your life in a big way, like interfering with your ability to do your work? I was doing this interview mm -hmm. with John Cho. We all good? We decided so for some reason we were going to do it at the top of this top building. I did it. I, I couldn't refuse. I mean, it's my job. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And it's kind of hard to explain, but I have a fear of heights. I feel like it's not like a normal fear of heights. Um, I'm worried that I will jump off of things, basically, is, is what happens. Regardless of whether or not it's fear of heights or, you know, a form of OCD, the good news is that this sort of issue uh, is one of the most effectively treatable uh, conditions, not just in mental health, but also in all of healthcare. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. That conversation was real. What's not so real is the way Dr. Aronovich wants to treat me. He's one of about 200 therapists testing a new virtual reality platform with his patients. Most people have only used VR to play video games. But now that VR technology is getting cheaper, people are starting to use it for other things, like therapy. Limbix, a small startup in Palo Alto, is developing VR experiences that mimic real life. Maybe you can tell me what you're seeing right now. It's a good place to start. Welcome to Limbix VR. Take a moment to adjust your headset, get comfortable, and prepare for therapy. Like this driving scenario with variable intensity and danger. The idea is that if someone's afraid of something, the best way to treat them is to gradually expose them to it. And over time, their fear will get less intense, or even go away. What other kind of environments do you have that you've already put together? So public speaking is obviously a really uh, common anxiety for people. If you want, you can stand up in front of the crowd. Remember, you can look around in all directions, see your presentation. And then once the therapist decides, okay, Dexter's comfortable talking in front of this positive, casual audience, yeah. you can then make the audience angry. <laughs> right? We we're distracted, we're okay. angry, we're not really paying attention. Right. I, I would not have thought of this one. I would. Uh, I mean, heights, yes. Cars, sure. This is this is kind of this is a little bit off the beaten path. Limbic's long-term plan is to sell its software to large institutions like VA hospitals and drug and alcohol treatment clinics. So far, Limbic's has three million dollars in VC funding, and they're six months into their testing program with therapists. So, are you seeing something? Yes. Uh, looks like sand, maybe a beach. Yeah, great. If you're feeling comfortable, my plan would be to kind of take it up a notch. Sure, yeah, let's do it. Okay, I think this one might be a good option. Whew. Take it to the edge here. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. Okay. I would never do this in real life. Okay, what's the uh, sense right now? The sense is, why am I here? Okay, hold on one second. I think you should be transported to a bridge. Gabe? Yep. Did you just take it to 11? Is this 11? <laughs> just be honest with me. Uh, this, is it? I mean, it's dependent on you. Does it feel like an 11? Uh, I mean, I don't know how much higher you could take it. This is pretty bad. <laughs> so is this 100 out of 100? Is that uh, what you're saying? We're, we're pushing 80 and 90. Yeah, this is this is up there. Well, let's stop here. Whenever you're ready, I would say go ahead and take that sure. headset off. Whoa, hi. Yeah, hey, welcome back. <laughs> What's up? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, how was that for you? So it felt realer than I thought it would. 
Interesting. Yeah. You know, it's still different than actually being there, sure. right? But it's impractical to go there. Yeah. And so this really kind of bridges us between, you know, office-based imaginal exposure where I just ask you to imagine it um, and being there. Dr. Aronovich says that properly treating my fear of heights could take a few months of VR sessions. Considering I figured I'd have to be terrified of ledges for the rest of my life, that doesn't sound so bad. That's Vice News Tonight for Thursday, January 25th. 